So we're continuing this series that we've been talking about like forever all summer. Anybody ready for fall? I'm, I'm just, I'm a little tired. I'm a little tired of the hot weather. But uh, so we're talking about community and what we've really been saying is that there are certain things. Well, first we said that all of us were created to do relationships with one another. But as followers of Jesus, which means if you're not a follower of Jesus, you can just sit back and listen to how those of us who are followers of Jesus should treat each other, even though we don't treat each other this way a lot of times. But we've been talking about some characteristics that should define our Christian community, like, like things like being authentic with one another, not putting a mask on or pretending when we're around other followers of Jesus. We've talked about accepting that we should accept one another the way Jesus has accepted us. We talked about how we, we need to follow Jesus' model of in, including everybody, saying you're in. We want you to be a part of us. You're welcome here. Things like that. Those, those kind of things. Well, today I want to talk to you about what I would say is the number one enemy to community. Now think about it for a minute. What would you say is the number one enemy to community? I'll give you, I'll answer it for you. You are. <laughs> Thanks for coming today. We're going to close in prayer. Um, no, nah, but, uh, but, you know, really the truth is we are the number one enemy to community, especially Christian community. If we're to live the kind of community that God wants us to live, the thing that gets in the way of that is us a lot of times. But let me say it in a way that might be a little less offensive um, so you can talk about somebody else and not yourself for a little bit. Um, so the number one enemy to the Christian community is this, self-centeredness. The idea, the focus on ourselves. See, self-centeredness, and, and you know this if you're in any sort of relationship at all, it's a relationship killer. Think back to any problem or any fight or any trouble you've had in any relationship that you've been in, and usually one or both parties have had some kind of self-centeredness going on in that equation, right? James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, you know what causes fights and quarrels among you? You don't get what you want. In other words, you are the problem. <laughs> that's that's kind of what he gets at. And it's the same way with, when it comes to community, that, that self-centeredness is this community killer. And the reason why is because a self-centered person never contributes anything to the community. They're just sucking things out of or out from the community, and it ends up destroying community. So if we want to figure out how to develop healthy community as a church family, then we need to address this issue of self-centeredness because um, instead of being people that are self-centered, and this isn't like profound, like if you've been in church in any amount of time, you've probably heard this before, but um, that, that our focus should be on others and God. Right? That's the simple solution to destroying the enemy of self-centeredness, right? That our focus isn't on ourselves, but our focus is on others, and our focus is on God and what he's done for us and all, all of that. But the problem is, all of us, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how spiritually mature you think you are, all of us struggle with self-centeredness. We all have a tendency to prioritize ourself and our wants and our wishes and our needs over others. And we all struggle with keeping our focus on God instead of focusing on ourselves. We know that, right? So how can we deal with this enemy of community? Well, I want to look at a story this morning out of the Gospel of Luke where this really, really weird thing happens. And Jesus uses this really, really weird thing that would make all of us uncomfortable. I'm sure it made everybody in this story uncomfortable. Actually, I know it did. You'll see that in just a minute. Um, but he uses this to teach all of us a lesson about how to destroy this enemy of self-centeredness. It's found in Luke chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 36. Um, if you have your Bible, you can pull it up there. If you're using the YouVersion Bible app, you can go to the events section on there. And all the notes and the scriptures from today are on that. We're going to also put these verses up on the screen. But let's um, dive in and see what Jesus has to teach a Pharisee by the name of Simon and you and me about how to defeat this enemy of self-centeredness. He starts off like this. He says, when one of the Pharisees, and we'll come find out later his name's Simon, but it doesn't tell us his name at the first. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, this sounds pretty nice, right? Jesus gets invited over to a meal at somebody else's house. I love it when people invite me over for a meal, especially if you know how to cook, you know? Um, if you don't, just don't do that. But Jesus, he's off uh, you know, all the time going over to somebody's house to eat. And here he gets invited by this Pharisee over to his house for dinner. Now, 
we read this and we're like, oh, it's cool. Jesus got invited over to this guy's house. But for Jesus to be invited to the house of a Pharisee for a meal was a really big thing. In other words, when it uses that word invited, it actually means that Jesus is a guest of honor at this banquet that this Pharisee is putting on um, for his friends, his neighbors, and whoever, whoever else. But before we read on, I need to tell you a little bit something about what goes on in, or kind of the etiquette, I should say, of being invited as a guest to a banquet in Jesus' day. See, there was a certain, I, I don't know what the etiquette's like at your house at dinner, but when I was growing up, my mom is like an etiquette Nazi. Like, like she went to those classes. I don't know if you guys ever went to etiquette classes, you know, where you figure out where to put the 18 forks and the 16 spoons and everything. But, um, but what I took away from that is the fork goes on the left side and the knife goes on the right side. You know, that's all I know. But um, in Jesus' day, there was a certain etiquette that went along with getting together um, for one of these banquets. If you notice, like I said, it says that Jesus was invited to this Pharisee's house. And that tells us that Jesus was a guest of honor. And, and, that, and I don't know if you know, um, um, I don't know how you greet people when they come over to your house. You know, you open the door, say, come on in, you shake their hand, you know, maybe you give them a hug if you're one of those kind of people, um, like I'm not. But, you know, you, the, but in Jesus' day, the way you greeted somebody who came over to your house, specifically a guest of honor, was with a kiss. And if the guest of honor was on equal social status with you, you'd kiss them on the cheek. You know, maybe you've seen Italians do that. You know, we don't really do that in our culture a lot, but that's what you did in Jesus' culture. If it was this guest of honor who was of a higher status than you, like a rabbi, you would kiss them on the hand, which is a little weird. We know that, right? But that's just what you did in this culture, right? You would greet someone with a kiss. And, um, and, and, but if, you, if someone came over to your house to eat and you didn't greet them with a kiss, it would be almost like you inviting someone over to your house and they knock on your door and you're just sitting at your couch watching Wheel of Fortune and you just ignore them the whole time they're there, right? It was a slap in the face to not be greeted with a kiss, whether it's a kiss on the cheek or a kiss on the hand. As we're going to read in just a minute, Jesus was greeted with neither. Also, one thing you need to know about um, being invited over to somebody's house as a guest of honor is that whenever a guest was invited into home for a meal, a home for a meal, it was mandatory for the host or for someone to wash the guest's feet. That's just what you did. And, if, and, and this was kind of important because the way you ate was not like how we eat. You know, we eat sitting at tables most of the time or in front of the TV. But they would eat kind of reclining. It actually says this in the verse. With your feet kind of sticking. Can, can you imagine like, like someone's feet in your face while you're eating a little bit? But that's, a little, that's kind of how it went a lot of times for a lot of these. They were reclining at the table. And so it was... It was just a sanitary thing for one to wash someone's feet when they came in because they've been walking around town. They didn't have sanitation. You get the picture in your mind. You know what I mean? And it was also just a, a polite thing because everybody's feet were dirty and, and everything. And, and if you had a guest that came to your home who was of higher status, you as the inviter would wash their feet. If it was a guest of equal status, you would have a servant wash their feet. And if you were a guest that had... The, or if you were a host that was just a jerk, you would point to the bowl of water and say, wash your own feet, right? Well, when Jesus gets to this Pharisee's house, nobody washes his feet. And nobody points at a bowl of water and says, Jesus, wash your own feet. One other thing you need to know is that, um, that often someone who would do something, to, what, or something that somebody would do to honor their guest was to anoint them with oil. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of anointing with oil. That's not something we practice in our faith tradition. But it was, it was actually just something that they did kind of to refresh the guest. And it was thought to be hygienic. It was an act of cleanliness for the guest. But what happens, as we'll read in a minute, is that no anointing oil was offered to Jesus. See, in this story, Jesus arrives at this Pharisee's home. He's invited. He shows up. And he receives nothing. No greeting of a kiss, no water for his feet, no anointing oil, nothing. Now we read that and it kind of just flows over our head, but this is a deliberate slap in the face to Jesus. And Jesus knows it. And everybody at the banquet knows it. And all of a sudden, right before they even get to the meal, things get a little uncomfortable. 
There's some tension in the room. It's this slap in the face. But Jesus, who could have, he had every right to. There were people in the room that probably expected him to get up and walk out at this moment because of how he was rejected by this Pharisee. Jesus instead uses this slap in the face as an object lesson to teach the Pharisee, the crowd, and us an incredible lesson. Now, before I read what's next, you also need to realize that a banquet in Jesus' day was also a very public affair. Like if you invite somebody over to your home for dinner, let's say, you know, I invite Gary and Ginger over to my, I'm not inviting you, but if I invite Gary and Ginger over to my home for dinner, you know, um, I expect Gary and Ginger to show up at dinner, right? But in Jesus' day, if someone invited somebody else over, anybody from the community could come and hang out at the banquet. They couldn't eat But they can come and stand around the group, which is weird. I get that, you know, would you want somebody standing around watching you eat? But that's just how it works here. But they could come and stand around and just kind of listen in on the conversation and feel like they were a part of everything that was going on. So with all of that in mind, imagine that Jesus is invited to this banquet by this Pharisee. There are some people hanging out, just paying, you know, Jesus is there, so we got to go find out. And that's where the story goes next. We read this in verse 37. It says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, and I just want to define what sinful life means. That means that she was a prostitute, okay? Everybody in town knew what she did for a living. So let's read on. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, this sinful woman, she had heard that Jesus was going to be just down the street, and she had, and so she went to meet him. And but this tells us something weird. Like it's it's understandable, it's brave on her part because of what she did for a living to show up at this Pharisee's house. But it was understandable that she would show up. But it's really weird that Luke would tell us that she came there with an alabaster jar. A perfume. I mean, I don't know what you do with your cologne or your perfume, but you probably don't take it to a dinner party. So this is kind of odd what's going on here. Um, but this jar will come into play next because as um, I learned this past week, I think this is fascinating. The reason why this woman had an alabaster jar of perfume is it was very important to her profession. Because, you know, in that day and age, they weren't taking showers every morning and every night like I do. They bathed very rarely, like some of you do. And, um, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, things got a little, you know, rank at times. And so she used this to kind of cover up the body odor that went along with what she did for a living. You just learned something new. You just put a picture in your head, which was a little weird, but that's kind of what's going on here with this. But think about this. This jar is going to come to play with what happens next. Look at verse 38. It says this. As she stood behind him, so remember, they're lounging at the table. That's kind of how they eat. She's standing behind him. Um, um, As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, This brings up all sorts of questions, right? I mean, we can understand why she might be weeping. She's in the presence of Jesus. She'd heard about Jesus. But why did she wet his feet with her tears? And why does she wipe them with her hair? It's weird. And then why does she kiss them? And then why does she pour her perfume on them? I mean, this is this is weird. This was weird for them, just like it's weird for us. I mean, can you imagine being at this party and all of a sudden this woman that everybody knows about in town, right? She shows up and starts weeping and wiping her tears with, on, on Jesus' feet with her hair and then kissing his feet and then anointing them with oil. I mean, why? why? It's so weird. Well, why would she do this? Well, I think that This woman, she'd heard about Jesus, just like a lot of people had heard about Jesus, right? Remember the word got around about Jesus? People came from miles to meet Jesus. People who had sick kids came to Jesus to heal their kids. I mean, Jesus had a reputation, and this woman knew of Jesus' reputation, and she knew that Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. She knew that, and so she wanted to meet this guy. She needed to meet this guy that she had heard so much about. She knew that this was a guy who showed acceptance and forgiveness to people. 
And she knew that she needed acceptance and forgiveness. And so she's in this present, the presence of this man that she had heard so much about. And she's overwhelmed by being in Jesus' presence. And she's weeping. And then she remembers how Simon, the Pharisee, slapped Jesus in the face by not giving him a greeting kiss, by not anointing him with oil, by not washing her feet. And she's so moved by what she's experienced and what she's seen that she knows she has to do something. And so when she saw that the Pharisee didn't wash Jesus' feet, she washed his feet with her tears. And when she saw that the Pharisee didn't greet Jesus with a kiss, she greeted Jesus with a kiss by kissing his feet. And when she saw how Jesus wasn't given given any anointing oil, she anoints him with her expensive perfume, but not just a few drops, but with the entire jar with probably everything that she had of value in her possession. Can you imagine that scene? Can you imagine the tension in the room at that moment? The silence. Everybody's looking around, you know, people are elbowing one another, you know. Everybody's squirming in their seats a little bit. It's one of those awkward moments. Jesus knows it's awkward. Everybody's watching including the host. And we read this next about him. It says, um, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, now when it says he said to himself, that means he's thinking to himself. And anybody that's ever read through the New Testament knows that whenever somebody's thinking to themselves, Jesus knows what they're thinking, which you should be careful what you think around Jesus because he's going to call it out, right? So this guy's thinking to himself, if this man were a prophet, he wouldn't know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is that she is a sinner. Like if this guy knew who this person was, like Jesus didn't know who she was. If this guy knew who she was, he would be furious at this moment. And this Pharisee is upset. And so Jesus, knowing what he's thinking, launches into a story. Look at what it says in verse 40. Jesus answered him, Simon. Here's finally introduced to his name, Simon. Which I love, by the way. Jesus actually calls him by name. He knows his name. He knows your name. And that wasn't in the notes, but it just amazes me that Jesus, when he talks to us, he doesn't say, hey, you. He says, Jonathan, or whatever your name is. That's just amazing to me. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. What's going to happen? Goes on. Story. Two people owe money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other owed him 50 Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Let me ask you. If Jesus told you this story, this little parable, how would you answer his question? Which one's going to love him more? Yeah, the one who owes him the 500, right? He had a greater debt that was forgiven, right? Well, Simon knows this. Everybody in the crowd knows this, so Simon has to answer with that answer, but he answers with a little bit of reluctance. He says this, so Simon replies, I suppose. (laughs) Like he can't commit fully (laughs) to the answer. He's like, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And then um, we read Jesus' response. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And then look what he says. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? you got to picture this in your head. Jesus is talking to Simon while looking at the woman. And he's looking at the woman and he asks Simon, do you see this woman? See, the reason why he asked that is because Jesus knew Simon didn't see this woman. What Simon saw was an object. What Simon saw was a sinner. He didn't see a real person that was created in the image of Jesus. He didn't see a woman at all. He saw someone who was beneath him, who didn't even deserve to be in his patio for this banquet. She was the town prostitute. There was no way she should have been there. He didn't see a person at all. And, but Jesus does. Because remember, he's looking directly at her when he says, do you see this woman? And then as he's looking at her, he says this, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears 
and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Can you imagine the discomfort in the room? Verse 47. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. See, this weird act of, that this woman did to show, um, was all to show love to Jesus. These tears, these wiping of his feet, the kissing of his feet, the anointing of his feet with this expensive perfume. It was all to express her love towards Jesus. Um, and then we read this, verse 48. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Remember, this is the first time he actually speaks to her. He'd been speaking to Simon while looking at her, but still looking at her. He tells her, her sins are forgiven. And then he sa- it says this, the other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Now, the reason why they asked this is because everybody who was in the crowd that day knew that the only one who could forgive sins was, was God. And for Jesus, this rabbi who had showed up at Simon's house for dinner, when he says, your sins are forgiven, basically he's saying, I have the right and the power as God to forgive sins. I am God. This is a declaration of his divinity. And everybody in the crowd heard it. And everybody in the crowd is uncomfortable. And this declaration is eventually what gets Jesus killed a few years later. But let me read this. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What I love about this is Jesus comes to the house of the Pharisee and everybody who's there at the dinner and everybody who's standing around on the walls paying attention to the party and seeing what's going on. They think that Jesus is going to honor the faith of the Pharisee. But instead, Jesus honors the faith of the sinful woman, the one who nobody in the crowd thought should have their faith honored. Um, See, when it comes to not being the type of community that we are supposed to be as followers of Jesus, and this isn't just relevant to our church family, this is relevant to the Big C Church all over the world, but, you know, we're just going to talk to those of us who are Hub City people right now. But one of the reasons why community suffers is we tend to be a lot like Simon in this story. And the way we're like Simon is we could care less about others at times. Remember how he rejected Jesus, uh, like slapped him in the face by not greeting him, by not washing his feet, by not anointing his head with oil. We, we, we could care less about others while giving the impression that we do care because, you know, he invited him over for dinner. But that was just a facade because when Jesus gets there, he really shows his true intention. We, we come across that way a lot of times. While at the same time, we're, we focus on the faults of those people around us instead of focusing on the stuff that we should be focusing on. See, we're really good. I mean, I know I am, and I'm pretty sure you are as well. We're really good at noticing what other people are doing wrong, right? I mean, how many of you have had a conversation, especially if you're married, how many of you had a conversation with your spouse this week about somebody else and what they're doing wrong, right? We were in Chicago. I went to a conference this week. We stayed at my sister-in-law's house, um, which was great because they weren't there and we had the whole house to ourselves, except, except, except for their dog, which was cool, cool. Dogs are cool. And their cat. (laughs) Now, let me tell you. The cat, like, gets up on the counter. I know some of you love cats, and I'm still praying for you because that's weird. But it gets on the kitchen. The water bowl for the cat sits next to the sink. Who does that? I mean, you know what I mean? It's just disgusting, right? So we spend time making fun of her for her cat, which is a beautiful cat. It's just evil and of the devil. But, um, but the thing is, <laughs> hey, tigers don't get on the kitchen counter, okay? So I'm um, just telling you, they don't come in my house either. But... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I think we're really good. We've developed this habit of noticing faults in other people. And I say that intentionally. We de- we've developed a habit. We've developed a pattern of thinking where our first inclination a lot of times is to notice what's wrong in those around us. And that's exactly what Simon was doing in this story. 
But instead, Jesus redirects Simon as I think he's redirecting us to what is most important, to focus on what God has done for us. And then after we focus on what God has done for us, then we can have the right focus on others. It's the antithesis of being self-centered. So in light of what Jesus teaches in this story, I think there are four things that we can do to kind of help us redirect our thinking towards others so that we can become less like Simon and we can become better investors in a healthy community. And what's cool is of these four things, you already did three of them this morning. We can put them up there, Randy. Um, Adoration, gratitude, confession, and service. See, there's something about adoration that we turn our whole attention to who God is. Now, adoration is different from gratitude. Gratitude is we thank God for what he's done. Adoration is we praise him for who he is. And when we turn our complete attention to who God is, it takes our focus off of those messy, misfit people around us, right? Gratitude, when we thank God for all that he's done, it's really hard to be upset with someone when you're thankful for them, right? It's really hard to be upset with what's going on when you express gratitude about little things and big things when you have this habit. Confession, because confession turns your, fo- your focus in a healthy way on yourself, on your messes and your sin instead of somebody else's sin. See, I do think God wants us to notice sin. He just wants it to be our sin that we notice that leads us to confession and then to drive us to, towards an outward focus. We need to, be, we need to have this, this habit of service where we're thinking of others first. One of the guys that was at this conference that I was at um, made this statement. He says, the church always looks better when fighting for the other's rights instead of its own. I love that. The church always looks better when it's fighting for the other's rights instead of its own. I kind of rephrased it and said it this way. The church is at its best when it doesn't focus on itself. And I think if we're guilty, a lot of us are honest, a lot of us are guilty of focusing on ourselves way too much when it comes to Christian community. I want to follow up that last thing on their service by saying, good news, we've got places for you to put this into practice right now, okay? Um, And we're going to be, I'm just letting you know, if you keep coming back next week, I'm going to be harassing you about this for the next few weeks until, you know, we get some of these um, needs met. But we've got a lot of needs here at Hub City coming out of COVID, you know, um, but it's there are just a bunch of holes that we're looking to fill, and some of you can fill those holes. Let me just put some of these up there. Um, these are not all of them, but um, so, so if, if you want to help with babies, a good way to serve is helping with babies. Joy Holden's in the back. Stand up, Joy. Wave your hand around. Yeah, you know, be embarrassed because introverts love being pointed out in a room. Um, uh, preschool, Sally Giles, she's actually in the preschool, and she's in the preschool every single week. And some of y'all need to volunteer to help out with that. Um, Ella Mary, Jennifer Curry, raise your hand, Jennifer. Yes, there you go. Um, greeting, where's, uh, where's Jamie? Jamie's right back there. If you want to help out the greeting, gre- Jamie is so faithful. He's at the door opening it for you guys. Jamie's better than all of you because <laughs> it's hot as crap outside every single Sunday morning, and Jamie still stands out there and greets you guys. So he puts the rest of you guys to shame. Some of you need to be suckers like Jamie. That's what I'm saying. Um, Sound and video, Trey Hennon, he's up on the sound back there. Um, then you got PowerPoint, Randy, who's up on the PowerPoint right there. Um, coffee, Daryl. Oh, where'd you go, Daryl? He's back there. He's on the balcony, too. All you balcony people. Hmm. Um, then you got grief groups. Jamie, where are you, Jamie? If you want to help with grief groups, she's back in the back. And then facility maintenance, you got Victor and Mark over here. You can fight for which one looks better and um, talk to them. But... This is, these are just a few of the needs that we have. These are some people that want you to be on their team. And here's my, my goal or my desire for you is that you would pick something and do it. Some of you are already doing something. That's cool. Some of you that are doing something could do one more thing, and that would be awesome. Some of you aren't doing anything. 
And do you know what that makes you when you come to church and you don't do anything? A consumer. And that's an American value, not a Christian value. And the last thing I want us to be is a church of consumers. And so I'm saying this to encourage you to get off of the bleachers and into the game. I know some of you aren't sports people, but it's a great, you know, to get off of the bleachers and into the game. And here are some of the places where you can do that. And when you do that, something is going to happen. You're going to make our community stronger. And you know why you're going to make our community stronger? Because your focus is going to be on others, which I think will then drive your focus to God as you serve. So, what are you going to do with this? It's up to you. Let's pray. God, and I love this story. It's so moving. It just is such a reminder to me how often I am like Simon. And uh, my focus is not on you, and my focus is not on others, and I don't want to be like that, and I don't want us to be like that. In fact, I want us to be a community of Jesus followers whose focus is continually on you and what you've done and who you are and on serving and loving the people that you've put around us, regardless of how different they are from us. God, would you give everybody in this room um, insight and wisdom to know what they need to do with this message? And then would you give them the courage to actually follow through and do it? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, By the way, if some of those names that were up on the board, you don't know who those people are, you can come ask me and I'll point them out to you. I'll I'll send you in their direction. Um, But we always respond every week by sharing communion. There's a little cup in the seat back in front of you. Um, I should have had communion team on there so we can go back to bread and juice you know on the front but uh we share communion every week because it reminds us of the one who set the ultimate example for us to follow when it comes to all of this jesus who died on the cross for us to turn our focus towards god the heavenly father and so we take the bread which represents his body which was broken for us and this morning we just want to remember that We want to remember what Jesus has done, his sacrifice on our behalf. Let's eat and remember. And then we take the juice, which just represents his blood that was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. The reason why we can confess our sin is because we know we will be forgiven because of what Jesus has done for us. So let's take and remember. Jesus, we're thankful. Actually, that's, that's not even a strong enough phrase to say we're thankful. We are indebted to you because of what you've done for us. And we just remember that right now. And express to you our gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. As the band comes to lead us in a closing song, another way we respond every week is through giving. We don't pass any baskets around. In fact, though, I did see a really cool offering basket at this little concert venue that I went to the other day. It said, like, voluntary cover charge, you know, but I guess Mark pointed out that it really shouldn't be voluntary for those of us that are followers of Jesus, right? But, um, but you know, just think of these as the voluntary cover charge baskets. That's, that has nothing to do with it, but I um, probably shouldn't have said that. But um, So the baskets are in the room. You can just give it there, or you can give online, just as giving is an act of worship. It's how we... Uh, it's just another way, just like singing, just like listening, just like taking communion. It's a, it's a way that we kiss towards God and turn our affection and our attention towards him by giving him some of our finances. So I invite you guys to stand and let's close out singing.